And let's go ahead and put it from Black's perspective again, since we are featuring the old Indian defense, Ukrainian variation, as played by Rashid Netzmetinov. And of course, anybody who was watching yesterday knows why I went down this avenue today. The question was asked about my favorite player, and that's such a big question because in, in what terms are we speaking? In terms of just raw chess beauty? Well, we were showing a game by Mikhail Tal, and it reminded me of this, and I couldn't actually even think of Nezmetinov's name at the moment. I, it was slipping me, and somebody chimed in and, and put Nezmetinov's name in the chat window. I described the famous picture of him wearing that sash with all those medals. And somebody knew who it was. So that's what led me to this. And I found when I was uh, looking him up for some good games. Um, Jerry of Chess Network, I'm sure you're familiar with him. Uh, Jerry of Chess Network featured the Netsmetanov Immortal game that we'll look at. Oh yeah, I love Emery Tate. Emery Tate has been my hero since I was in the Navy. Uh, Emery Tate when I was in the Navy, Emery Tate was in the United States Air Force. So I've been, I had been familiar with him for years. Because Emery Tate, for something like, I forget how many years in a row, won the United States Armed Forces Open and Championship in chess. Of course, he became an international master, never achieved the GM title, but took down a lot of good GMs, had his moments of brilliance. So Emery Tate has for a long time been a hero of mine, though I didn't mention him yesterday as one of my favorite players. I guess I should have. Especially um, because he was a fellow service member. Um, although being in the Air Force probably favored him for opportunities. You know, when you're in the Navy, you just don't get as many opportunities. You're underway, you're haze gray. But nonetheless, what a player, and we're so grateful for his um, service to our nation, and we were saddened to hear of his death. So, yeah, the late, great Emery Tate. Anyway, we have the Tabia here for the um, Ukrainian variation e5. And in this line, Lienthal played knight to f3. Not an uncommon line. Knight b to d7. Knight to g3. And you know the bishop is coming to b2 when that happens. Knight takes d4. Pawn to g3, uh, g6. Bishop to g2. Bishop to g7. Castles and castles. So all normal stuff here. Pretty soon that pawn will probably come to c7 as well. There is pawn to b3. Knight to c5. Pawn to b4. Yes. Yeah, this is kind of transposed now into a different line. Knight to b3. Knight to d7. Bit of dancing around and repositioning pieces. Bishop to b2. Knight to e5. Now knight to a5. Curious looking move, but you know, you have it has its point. It has its point. Kind of focusing here with two attackers and one defender. So pawn to c5, this is a move I don't know that I could ever find. Okay, so bishop to g4. Bishop takes d4, c takes d4. 
Well, this looks pretty good for white on the king's side, anyway. I'm on the, on the queen's side. Although, this guy is lurking. This bishop is lurking in the shadows, ready to unleash his power. Okay, bishop to e6. So we have a super attack on the seaman. White has a super attack on the B-man. Pawn to c5. B5. Interesting. Of course, that pawn for you beginners is eligible for en passant. And he takes it en passant. So A takes B6. And that's interesting right here. This whole thing is interesting. First of all, let's come back back the truck way up here. After h3, bishop e6, c5. Is it even shocking that this guy opened the path for his rook? I mean, just think about this. How many of you would have opened the path and said, please take my rook? And he captured on passant. He captured back. And then <laughs> your radal would have. Sacks the rook. And here's the reason why. Uh, after, let's, let's not page through this too quickly. Sometimes I go a little too fast and I make the mistake of assuming that everybody can see. And that's a mistake I always criticize. So after A takes B6, that exactly... This bishop was really a strong, powerful bishop. And now the white squares are going to be in black's control. So after knight takes b6, and queen to a6, knight flees back to safety. And here's a good illustration of already beginning to exploit the white squares. Rook is under attack. He just leaves it there. He realizes the same thing, that, boy, if that, that bishop has so much power, I'll give my rook back and, and mitigate the extra power that black has on white squares of the board. d3. e takes d3. And you can tell already, there's already a threat. Exactly. There we go. So now we're threatening checkmate on the next move. So therefore, f3 is forced. It has to be played. And look at this, knight to g4. So knight to c4, throw in the check, leaving the king in the corner. This is really getting ugly. Queen to d5. White desperately hanging on. Rook to c2. There goes... The rook on f1. And he resigned here. He resigned here. There, there was He could have probably resign several moves ago. What, um, what options can, can white play? If he just takes this bishop, well, guess what? Queen h5 check. Exactly. He can stall. I mean, his only choice for the king is to move to g2. He can try stalling a few moves and just start giving pieces away. <laughs> That's checkmate. Of course, any other result is checkmate on the next move. And so... 
game over. So again, Nets Metinov with a nice attacking victory.